I'm not sure where to start with this video. Um, this may be one of the, the, the many reasons why I haven't been here in a while. Much like my D&D video, I feel like this is going to be a bit of a deep dive and a more in-depth view of my current new obsession. I am of course talking about Baldur's Gate 3. Hello beautiful people, welcome to the channel. If you're new here, hi I'm Mai, and if you're not so new, welcome back. So I've never played a D&D video game before, and as I've mentioned in my previous D&D video, I've been playing the tabletop game for a number of years now. At the moment, I'm about 30 hours into Baldur's Gate, and like every other RPG I play, I've barely touched the surface. Saying that, it's unlikely that there'll be spoilers in this video, but I, I will try to keep them to a minimum. You've been warned. It's a lot more threatening than I hoped it to sound. <laughs> so straight from the get-go, you are given the option to choose your difficulty level, which to be honest, I found pleasantly surprising. For some reason, I wasn't expecting a simple feature like this to appear in a D&D video game. Baldur's Gate 3 somehow manages to balance accessibility with complexity. Despite all the different mechanics and systems in the game, it never feels overwhelming. The game's difficulty options make it easy for players to adjust the challenge to their liking, and the game's tutorial does an excellent job at introducing players to the different mechanics. As you jump into the story, you are found aboard a Nautiloid, a mind flayer ship, and welcomed by a lovely tentacle pal, giving you a wonderful tadpole friend to live in your head. For those of you who are unfamiliar about Mind Flayer reproduction, it's not a pretty sight. Mind Flayer newborns aside, you can now create your character. Like most of you out there, I spent a fair chunk of my time in character creation. Thankfully, I already had my character in mind for one of my old D&D campaigns, but if you can't be bothered, there are plenty of origin characters at your disposal. The different races and classes are pretty standard and follow the player's handbook, which is a great way of introducing new players to the game and welcoming seasoned players back to familiarity. Now, I was a bit gutted that there were some races and classes not included in the game. Then again, they are either homebrew or from future supplements. For now, I suppose Feronia and Jimothy will have to be found in their human form. Also, it wasn't until I actually started writing the script and recording footage and doing more research for this video that I discovered that multiclassing is a thing in the game, which I was really worried was going to be missing. Unfortunately, there are certain classes and subclasses missing from the game, such as Artificers, Swashbucklers, and of course, my favourite, Circle Stars Druid, for selfish reasons, of course. As far as I'm aware, the game is complete and they have no plans of releasing any future DLC. For now, I will keep my fingers, toes, and eyes crossed for some mods at the very least. As I mentioned before, I'm not incredibly far in the game. In fact, I'm close to finishing Act 1 in the main storyline but there are still plenty of side quests, secrets I've yet to complete and discover, and my uh, companions to consider. Like any respectable D&D party, it is best you don't venture alone. Depending on how you play and your preferences, you will find more adventurers to join you on your mission to remove the squaring tadpole from your brain. You soon discover that every companion you find is also infected with the same parasite, so through your connections, it's only right to join forces and to save your skins. In my playthrough, I have my favourites, but thankfully with each party member, they have their different strengths and weaknesses. For example, for the majority of my playthrough so far, I have had Shadowheart, a trickery domain cleric, Gale, an evocation wizard, and a stereo on an arcane trickster rogue. Each playthrough is different with a variety of choices so your party is likely going to be different to mine. Without spoiling it too much, I have friends who have let certain party members go or die without any intention of saving them. On that note, I should probably mention the Astarian in the room. Or should I say romancing. Yep, you can romance your companions and if you've been on TikTok lately, at least my FYP, everyone seems to be lusting after our pale-faced rogue. Personally, he gives me a bit of the ick and I have my eyes set on other companions. <laughs> Between exploration, dungeon crawling and combat, you can spend your time at your campsite. Here you can trigger a much needed and mechanically beneficial long rest to replenish lost HP or spell slots, swap your companions not allocated in your party, or to spend time getting to know your fellow party members. Sometimes more than just a friendly chat. Sex. Now, if you're not interested in romancing NPCs, fair enough. Instead, let's take a look at how the game runs compared to a usual D&D session. 
The first thing I'd like to talk about is initiative. In the majority of the campaigns I play in, unless we use roll 20 during encounters, we tend to settle with the theater of the mind, which personally, I really love. So whenever you get into the fighting during Baldur's Gate 3, it's a moment of strategy. I'm not the most tactile person, but playing this way has made me rethink my home games and discover new actions I never thought could be done before. Like shoving, I didn't know that was a thing in D&D. Instead of focusing on only my character, it's an interesting perspective having the ability to control the rest of the party and learning their abilities through the fight. In a way, I'm thinking with a DM's cap on. The initiative in Baldur's Gate has been meticulously transferred from tabletop to screen. However, much to my annoyance, I've had to reload save several times after my party has been slain. For example, early in the game, you must fight some goblins in a camp along with their leaders, and I kept having to reload my save and backtrack because I would forget to carry out a certain tactic I had planned. Not a huge deal, but if you haven't saved in a while and you die during initiative, there's the frustrating task of remembering what you carefully carried out prior to combat. At some points, I'd been playing for 30 minutes before initiative was triggered accidentally or intentionally. Some might say it's controversial, but in this case, I don't see an issue in so-called save scumming. Play the way you want to play. Outside of combat, exploration is a huge part of the game and there'll be moments which bring me back to the sessions I've had in my usual campaigns. My DM will just roll the dice or ask us all to roll specific checks to see if we pass or not. In this case, it works very similarly. Instead of triggering a prompt to roll, the game will automatically roll to see if the party succeed or fail a check in particular environments. For example, if you pass a perception check, someone in your party might notice some traps or unsettled soil you can dig up to find a chest. Rolls can also be triggered during dialogue which, like in the tabletop game, can affect the outcome of a particular situation. These involve a d20 roll including your modifiers, positive or negative, with the option to add buffs from your other party members such as guidance. This creates a sense of tension and excitement as players venture further into the game's world and politics. Coming from someone who's never played a D&D video game and only done actual play, this is a nice touch considering you don't have other party members playing the game with you and offering advice. Following from that, I'm pleased to announce that multiplayer, both co-op and online, is available. I've yet to try it out, but from what I've seen with others, it's an invitation for strategic gameplay or antics, likely the latter with a sprinkle of delightful chaos. In conclusion, it's not easy to take a game that relies so heavily on player imagination and turn it into a visual experience. One of the biggest hurdles is trying to translate the complex rules and mechanics of the game into something that is more accessible to a wider audience. Larian Studios took on this challenge with Baldur's Gate 3 and it's safe to say that they succeeded beyond anyone's expectations. When it comes to adapting a tabletop game like Dungeons & Dragons into a video game, there are a lot of challenges that developers face. Not only did Larian Studios manage to do so, they faced those challenges head on and succeeded in developing a game both faithful to the source material and expanding from the adventure the game proceeds from, Descent into Avernus. They successfully accomplished the difficult task of creating a world that is both immersive and engaging without overwhelming or patronizing players. On top of that, the performances and expansive character storylines with their multi-spanning arcs are something to be applauded. With so many branching options, consequences and decisions to make throughout the game, the studio have worked incredibly hard hard to make sure the player doesn't get the exact same ending twice, resulting in over 17,000, yes, that many, possible endings throughout the game, much like the possibilities in any actual play game. Baldur's 3 is a triumph of game design, and it's clear that a lot of care went into making it. Whether you're a fan of tabletop games or just looking for an excellent RPG or really into D&D, Baldur's Gate is definitely worth the look. Now let us know in the comments below if you're currently playing Baldur's Gate 3 and if so, who are you romancing? If it's a Starian, I forgive you, I suppose. If you enjoyed the video, why not give it a little like and think about joining the party by subscribing to the channel. If you ring that little notification bell as well, you'll gain some inspiration. There's some lovely videos here you can check out in my Unlock a Secret Ending. And once again, thank you so, so much for watching and have a good one. Bye.